Okay, I'm, I'm going to call the meeting at 6.32. Welcome everybody who's here. Um, and uh, if you are going to make a public comment in just a couple of minutes, please let us know if you're on screen so that we catch your hand. Thank you. Um, are there any amendments to the agenda? Can I add one? I'd like to um, have a moment to discuss the KES bus route. That's okay. You can do that during public comment if you want. Okay, I can do that too. All right. Anybody else? All right, is there a motion to amend the agenda? Do we need one? Uh, yes, we do. I thought it was going to be in public comment. Oh, well, that's true. Sure. We don't need one. You're right. Thank you. All right, at this time, um, I will open us up for public comment. Hey, do you want to start? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, my discussion with this is, is twofold. One is just to bring the, the situation to the attention of the full board. And the sec second is to kind of dis discuss what the um, contractual obligations that Butler Bus has to the district. The Killington Bus, elementary school bus, is not running this week, just a.m. or p.m. We found out about it at 12.20 on Friday, um, which is significant because there are, there are children who just aren't going to come to school this week because they can't, they can't get to school, their parents don't have cars. Um, so I think it's important to, 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 to talk about that it's a big deal. And what is Butler Bus's obligation to us as a district um, financially to compensate for that since it's a driver that's not being run? And is could those funds be used for ride share purposes and or after school, um, the after school programs to kind of help people that generally don't can't afford the after school program, aren't enrolled in it, don't use it because they take the bus to other situations. So that's what I would like to open up in my public comment. Is it due to a lack of a driver? The driver um, quit, retired. Um, I would assume the driver gave adequate notice to Butler, but that's not for us to manage necessarily, so I don't know. But I know the district, Mayor Gutenberger, didn't know until Friday that there'd be no bus driver indefinitely. Um, I think they're looking at it on a week-by-week -week case. Um, so as of right now, next week is not covered. And I would assume again, we find out Friday again if the next week is covered. So, but what their personnel situation is, I don't know. And I don't know that it matters. I just think yeah, that's for them to manage. Is it okay for a response? Sure. So the contract is that if a run doesn't run, then we are not charged for that run. So there is the only thing in the contract, they don't guarantee drivers, but they do say if they aren't able to provide a run due to not having a driver, then we don't get billed. And I know Jim takes, and I think yeah, Jim's on the call. Um, he's on vacation, but he's zooming in. Um, but he does keep track of when it doesn't run, and they've been really good. And when when they don't have a driver and the run isn't happening, um, I know that Mary and Shana have been looking on some ideas. We looked, and I asked her to look at attendance and impact because this isn't the first time this year that the elementary bus hasn't run. So my understanding is there's um, some conversations happening about how it's primarily one area that serves. Killington mm -hmm. that is most challenged in terms mm -hmm. of transportation. And so they are working on a plan to meet that need. It is drivers and driver situations. I know people are doing all kinds of ways of promoting, but trying to find bus drivers since day one. And I know Raina, even the week before school started, we weren't guaranteed to have bus drivers for every run. When we offered the contract out, they were the only company that offered to fulfill our contract. Which I understand, and that's come up many times. And you're right, right, the bus hasn't run a day or two here and there for sure. Mm -hmm. And But part of outsourcing this is that we don't have to manage that. So mm -hmm. I guess what I'm, I'm wanting to know is when we aren't charged for that, mm -hmm. can that money be reallocated to the after school program so that kids can stay later or ride share um, to alleviate KES from having to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And I, at no point do I doubt that you guys are all over this and handling it and things are being taken care of. But if we don't talk about it and mention it at a full board, all of a sudden we're at the end of the school year and people are like, oh, this happened here, this happened here, this happened here, and we're not talking about it as it goes. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's been an issue. We've had this come up before. This is the longest I've known that we haven't had a driver. Um, and again, people can accommodate a day here, an AM shift here, a PM shift here for sure. That it's that we're at an entire week now mm -hmm. without necessarily a solution. Mm -hmm. And I don't not, not that we're going to have the solution here at this point. My again, my point was to let everybody know sure. and to um, look into whatever that financial impact is on the school and mm -hmm. make sure that we are able to to get these kids not have any kind of barriers to getting sure. children to their public education. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll talk to Jim when he comes back and see what all right what Jim. our options are. You're lucky you're on the vacay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Is there anyone else who would like to make a, a comment, public comment? All right, then we will get started. I do have one public comment. Uh, today, Sherry called me and told me that a Woodstock Union High School graduate named Victor Ambrose um, won a Nobel Prize in science for the discovery of microRNA. Um, if, if Jen would like to tell us what that is, that's, that would be great because I've read the whole I don't understand 90% of it. I don't understand a lot of it either. I saw science a very long time ago. I just had to look up the difference between mRNA and microRNA. So that was learning for me. So mRNA eventually codes for proteins and microRNA are just about gene expression. So this is some cutting edge research that I guess the honor was long overdue for their work. So super exciting that he attended our school. And he wasn't even the valedictorian. Okay. We were <laughs> able to, Dan North, <laughs> pull the year up and pull this transcript. I will not share his grades. I have the No, you can't the hear it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Anyone would like yeah. But um yes, it was very we had Boston Globe call us and shared. I had no idea. And if you go on with it, we aren't referred. It says he was born in Hanover, but he did attend Woodstock Union High School. And one of our retirees, one of our retired teachers, um, Bob Biddy, who was I thought he was old when I started teaching in the 80s, and he was there in 72 when Victor uh, graduated. He was, turns out he's a neighbor, and the kids grew up together with his kids, and um, he knew the whole family, the parents. He wasn't sure he should talk to the Boston Globe, but I assured him that he should. I've looked at some teachers there, and I've identified a couple more that I think are still alive. Most of them are not, um, and I'll try to contact because this reporter would like to do a little story about his early years. Um, and he came from a farm family and his father was uh, escaped Poland in uh, a concentration camp situation. So he comes from a very interesting background. And Bob's comment was the children were all uncommonly brilliant. <laughs> and so, and then uh, Nancy Stockwell, one of our teachers at the elementary school, sister graduated with him and she, she knew the family and said they were all really smart. So anyway, I'll send this around if you want to take a quick look at it on the yearbook. It's kind of interesting. All right. It's not every day that we have a graduate back. Uh, no, no. I, I don't think we've had any that I would know of, but in recent years. Owen, maybe in the future. It could be for sure. All right, then we will move into the reports. Sure. <laughs> Starting with Cheryl. <laughs> So just to report, um, I think thus far we've had a pretty smooth start to the school year. Um, I receive all the behavioral reports across the district. Um, what I notice that are that teachers and principals are really holding students to expectations, accountability, um, having conversations around behavior on the playground and the line and how they're working with students. So I. It's really good to see the level of individual conversations with students on a full range of behaviors, um, pre-K all the way through high school. So it's good for me to get a snapshot of how things are in the building. And I think our teachers and principals are very busy setting those expectations and making sure the school runs smoothly. Um, on September 20th, I met with 20 community members, alumni, parents, students, administrators, the school counselor, and teachers talking about designing a class that will help students plan their future. Um, we were able through uh, resources that were provided through the Mountain Views Innovation Fund, um, contract with Dustin Lou from, Stan uh, from Stanford University. Um, he was only supposed to come for one session, but he was so excited to hear that everybody was gonna be in person that he flew from San Francisco to be with us for two hours 
We had a great session. Um, he will be back with us at the end of the month to do a longer session, thinking about what would a class look like, what will we cover, and then we'll have uh, a final meeting where we'll put together a description that will go on the course catalog. Um, also wanted you to know that um, uh, we final uh, September 30th was the end of using ESSER money. It is gone, gone. Um, and as we often laugh, talk about in this uh, office, leave no dollar on the table. So we had some money left over for furniture. So myself uh, and the head of buildings and grants had selected furniture to place all through the hallways at different locations in front of the gym, as you walk through the main door, um, up by the back <laughs> ramp, just so that students have places where they can socialize and hang out. Right now, they're either sitting on the floor or on the windowsills. And so we really wanted to have some more appropriate furniture. Spoke with Owen about some couches for the senior lounge, though I nixed his navy blue yeah, color. I did. I, I about that. Yes. <laughs> so we uh, have some new couches and new back chairs that are going into the senior lounge. So it'll give us a chance to see what kind of furniture the students like. And again, make that building more welcoming for the students that are there now. Um, Two other really quick things. I wanted a couple shout outs. Um, wanted to recognize Lauren Gagney, who's our Spanish teacher at Woodstock Elementary School. She has been working with a student on the football team who does not speak English and has been translating all the games. His knowledge is soccer, is football. Lauren's knowledge of football is zero. So we're understanding, and there is no word for tackle in Spanish. So she's done a great job and really stepped up and allowed this student to fully integrate with the football team. I also wanted to say today, um, Saturday was World Teacher Day. And so we started tradition on the day follow, Monday following or thereabout is to recognize those teachers who have served the district for 10, 20, and 30 years. And today I gave out five 30 years. We have two teachers at Killington, uh, Lisa Laird and Missy Knipes. One teacher at Prosper Valley, and that's Jill Koresh. And at the high school, uh, Joni Kennedy, who is the admin assistant, and myself for 30 years of service to the district. So it's a new tradition, and teachers are really appreciated. So we try to do it not during Teacher Appreciation Week, but at a different time in the fall. So it's special. We uh, do it right in their classroom, and they have no idea we're coming, and it's really been fun. Well, congratulations to all of those folks, including you, Sherry. 30. Yeah, it's kind of scary. So that's my report. All right, thank you. Any questions for Sherry? All right, uh, we'll move into the with RAP, Director of Technology and Innovation. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll be really brief because we're going to be talking more about enrollment um, a little bit later on the time schedule of appointments. Um, so. Uh, just a quick update. We've been doing some security updates and investigating some different packages um, to improve our security posture. So we installed a new door access system using our last ESSER funds here at the central office. And we tried one location to see if it's something that we want to expand out to other locations on Stemming the Road. Um, so that's new. Um, so you may notice a different way when you're coming in and out of the building. Now. Second piece. Um, we're looking into ways for teachers at the middle school, high school to be able to put the building in lockdown on um, themselves um, quickly. And so we're looking at a couple different solutions um, for that to happen. And we're going to be um, evaluating those and then moving forward with something in the next month or so. Any questions for Raph? Thank you, Raph. Thanks. Um, Shana will give a report on the student support services. Good evening, I'm Shana Kalnitsky, and I wanted to share some highlights of our department from this month. I'd like to give a shout out to the nursing team who has organized a flu and COVID vaccine clinic, not only for the educators during the in-service day, but also for the community. So if you're looking for more information about that, definitely check the communications that the principals in the building sent out. Um, the one for the public is on October 12th. Um, the other um, note that I wanted to talk about is that Raph and I have been um, doing some data collection that we need to uh, send off to the state. 
and our homeless data has decreased by a third from last year um, to this year. So we have seen a decrease in families in transition who are struggling uh, without housing. The uh, third thing I did put in the board book notes, but I wanted to speak a little bit more about it. And we have some work going on that's being led by our interventionists in the district. And they don't just you know pull kids out of class and work with a small group of students, but they're also teacher leaders. And currently Kristen Hubble is teaching a class, the letters class that has been taught in the past by Julie Brown. And Julie Brown has passed the torch uh, to Kristen so Julie can be in the buildings and in classrooms with our teachers and co-teaching with them, modeling lessons uh, and informing their instructional design. The interventionists will also be co-facilitating the in-service data days in October, in November. And they'll be doing that work with the principals and working with teachers to look at their beginning of year mathematics and their literacy data so that they can design action plans to um, increase the outcomes of whole classes of students. And the one that I wrote about in the, in the board book is actually Marsha uh, Davis, who's an interventionist, reading interventionist in the middle school and high school. And she has been consulting with teachers and working with students, but she brought this new reading program called Rewards to our attention last year. And she dabbled with it a little bit. And this year, she and Julie Brown and Lauren Sullivan Justice, who is the department chair for the English department, are working with a group of teachers on Late Start Wednesday to support their inter, um, implementation of using this rewards program across the middle school and high school. So teachers will be learning how to use those materials, how to progress monitor, and really impact large groups of students. Thank you, Shana. Any questions? Yeah, quickly. Um, the reason that there are fewer students struggling with homelessness is that because they found homes or because they gave up on this area and left? Um, when some of these families come to our area, they often stay with family or they're in temporary housing situations. We still have families who rely on other family that seems to be a little bit more stable. And then some people find other opportunities in more populated places, because as we know, it's very difficult to access public transportation, medical care, going to the grocery store, getting your kid a pair of sneakers. So they have, you know, sought more populous areas. Oh, no, that was my question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Shana. You have a lot of strands to, <laughs> to handle. Um, uh, Jen, we do a report from curriculum instruction and assessment. Okay, so I have a few things to share out about today. First, I want to speak to our work in building our teacher capacity through professional learning. So we've launched many efforts so far. We have our math pack work, which is picking up teachers that haven't had that experience yet, learning about how we teach math in our school district. We have Kristen Hubble teaching letters, which is a replacement for Julie, as Shana mentioned. So the teachers that haven't had that learning about literacy yet, they are also getting picked up and having that learning. Um, and we are also having our Late Start Wednesdays, which have started. And Late Start Wednesdays are one of the ways in which our teachers get to interact with and learn about our EID policy. Um, and we have some great pathways this year, which teachers have choice over. Um, Sherry is leading a group on a 10 day equity challenge where people get to look at their own biases and consider those and have a group conversation about how those biases might be impacting their daily practice. Uh, Mary Guggenberger at Killington is working with her teachers to design equitable learning opportunities for all students. And uh, we have book studies around unconscious bias and even a deep dive into restorative justice at the high school and middle school. So we're in that launch and lots of learning opportunities happening and just wanted to thank everyone for engaging in that. Uh, secondly, I wanted to share that Aaron and I are taking a course offered through the BPA about new education quality standards that are going to be happening uh, to, to us with us in 2025. Um, and uh, we're engaging in this course because um, 
we have a lot to learn about what these new standards bring. It is a multi-day course throughout the course of this year. A lot of curriculum directors and principals and superintendents are taking it. Um, and our early experience with the education quality standards um, has been interesting. Uh, for example, the purpose statement alone is four times the length in this newest version. And in that length includes um, some language that I thought I'd share with everyone around the table. I actually want to read it directly from the education quality standards because I think we're actually well positioned to take on this work with our equity, inclusion, and diversity policy. So if you'll please like let me just read it a little bit, if that's okay. Um, these rules require each SU, S or SD to strive for culturally responsive pedagogy that critically examines and imparts comprehensive historical and socially conscious understanding of the causes and effects of bias and discrimination, why all per persons should have equitable access to social and economic opportunity, why persons and institutions must identify and prevent individual, group, and systemic racism, discrimination, and all forms of unfair treatment, and finally, the positive and multifaceted contributions of different social, cultural, racial, linguistic, ethnic, and indigenous groups to the historical and ongoing project of building and strengthening democracy in the United States and globally. That's language that did not exist in the previous education quality standards. It requires a lot of work for us. Um, and so as we dig into these standards and understand them more, we're going to have to evaluate how we meet the standards in a way that also meets our EID policy, but we are well positioned. Um, and so I just wanted to share that those are gonna be coming out in the next year. And Jen, who provides those standards? Who writes them? Um, so they were written by a group called the Act One Ethnic Studies Group, but ultimately they come from the State Board of Education. Lots of people had, I had an opportunity to contribute. So the groups of superintendents were working. Lots of people were involved in writing these standards that may be why they're so long yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> wow it's a lot to unpack i mean there's it a is. lot of words <laughs> going to be years Multiple. and years worth of work yeah but i would agree it's challenging how do we get evaluated on these things <laughs> oh, no they don't <laughs> jerry might have something to say oh no so I, I know <laughs> i was at the meeting when they said they don't have a way to evaluate it at this time well i met with this i was at a meeting with the secretary of Educa interim secretary on friday and i think what we're looking at and the superintendents association identifying the top four or five standards that can be assessed and really focusing in on those standards because a number of the ones that are in there there's no way to assess it so working with the AOE and the Superintendents Association, really narrowing in what are some of these standards that are accessible, and then how do we set the standards of process? So I think it's a point of conversation at this point. It's a long document. Yes, Adam. Just an observation of, and, and Sherry will recall this and maybe some other folks too, but what was it four years ago um, at a district just south of us, the superintendent, you know, his demise basically came around promoting just some discussion of what, what you're doing and the work that you're investing in. And it, um, it was really disheartening to kind of witness that, uh, the lack of, you know, progression in terms of thought process. And it, it all really started around, he was fully supportive of a couple of high school students doing some shared readings during the summer. And uh, some members of the community caught wind of it, and uh, you would have thought that he, you know, something had done something extreme, right? But here in this district, and I think this is a really nice comment about where we are. Of this is, you know, the, the district, the teachers, people are fully invested in this. Um, and granted, there's not a big public turnout tonight, but there's not, there's never been one peep, and never was there, right? At the same time that Zach was going through that in this district of uh, any concerns or reservations about you know how dare we, we we think more progressively and introduce some new thought concepts into education and the sad part Zach was a major author of this yeah. Of standards yeah thank you for reminding us that no thank you anybody else yeah uh, uh good evening all good thank evening. you for uh, taking my question. Um, does this have to be specific to educational content? Because when I think about what most uh, 
folks, not necessarily in our community, but general population, um, the most forward facing uh, representative thing of our community at, at the Mountain Views and specifically at the middle school, high school is the mascot. Um, and when thinking about, you know, the biggest things that is going that are going to make our community as equitable as possible and attract more diversity. Um, this is a, you know, a point that we've dug into before and had great momentum. Is that something that could be a priority when we look at uh, making our uh, community more inclusive? Great thought. Thank you, Anna. Anybody else? I just have one more yes, to share. Sorry, <laughs> I should save that for last. No, this will be quick. Um, the uh, I just wanted to say that the middle school, after um, going through the um, Anley evaluation last year, it's sort of a self evaluation and with actually feedback from parents and students about where our middle school can improve. Um, one of the results of that was. Um, a focus on improving our advisory program. So I just wanted to share that more professional learning that's happening is um, our middle school team is going to meet meeting with um, the Middle Level Education Association um, three times this year to do a book read about best practices around advisory and um, consider how to implement those for next school year. So um, I just wanted to share that that was one outcome of some of that evaluative work last year, and we're going to continue to improve there in advisory. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Um, the Director of Finance and Operations, Mr. Jim Fenn. Yes, I'm up here on the main coast, but I'm ready. Um, the Finance Office um, has been working with the leadership team as we continue to work on our budget proposal. Um, as we've discussed, our target reduction in spending is 2,390,000 and some change of which a little over a million is coming from our debt refinancing with the remaining 1,383,788 be coming from sustainable reductions in the budget. Our, our goal is to have the reductions uh, cause the lowest impact possible on student learning at all levels in our district. Um, as you look down through my, my uh, notes in the agenda, you can see the areas that um, where, where we, at this moment, we believe the funding is coming from. And uh, we continue to work on that and we'll have something uh, for the finance committee uh, shortly and then for the full board uh, in, um, in December, but the finance committee later this month and again in November. I uh, just wanted to bring you up to date. There's been a recall on the charging system on the 12 volt system on our electric buses. So they're currently out of commission doesn't impact our daily routes. Uh, the only thing impacting that is the lack of drivers, which um, we're painfully aware of, and Emo and I are in contact on that. Um, but they are out of service. We expect them to be back shortly. There was apparently a, an issue with a particular component in this version of the bus for about a 90-day manufacturing period, and we happened to get three of them with that problem. Um, the other thing I noted is that the business office team is away for several days of software training. We're taking advantage of it this year because this is the last year that I put in the budget. It will not be in next year's budget. And um, as we uh, move forward, we'll be reducing some of those opportunities. That's it. Any questions for Jim? All right, thank you, Jim. Um, we uh, have our student uh, students report. Aidens is here, and Owen said he will share his report verbally. Yes. Um, so I see Aiden was talking about the fact that we had a club fair recently, which was good. That was pretty well attended. We do that every year at the high school. It's organized by the student council. So um, different groups come in. We had. You know, even groups from technically outside the school, like Change the World Kids, were there. And I think it was pretty well attended. Definitely the most robust club fair we've had in my time. Um, and then I think relevant to the board, I recently sent out an application to all students except seniors, because it's kind of useless to us for this position, not actually for a student member of the board, but for a student representative. And um, so we'll have some applicants to review in the coming weeks. We'll be working on that, whittling it down to, I think, 
probably two to four students that we would submit to the board um, for consideration. And then you could do what you wanted with those names. You could nominate them to the board as non-voting members, or you could not, you could hold off. But we think in the new year, we'll have some students in here um, just kind of shadowing, watching the meeting, seeing if they can sit through a hour-long budget proposal kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we figured if they could make it through the December yeah, board meeting. It's real trial by fire. So that's the final, uh, <laughs> the final circle of the inferno there. Um, and then so that they'll have they have like two weeks to submit their applications. Um, I've gotten a few already, actually, two or three. Um, also, we're working on the Student Leadership Summit. I'm meeting with um, Dr. Sinkamani in the morning um, on that. So that's well underway. We're definitely far ahead of schedule on that. And, um, you know, other than that, no, I mean, we have freshman elections. Our team's football is killing it. Um, other teams are on a, you know, on a gradient there. But, uh, yeah, I think students are doing pretty well. Great. Right. Thank you, Owen. Any questions for Owen? Comments? Just that you guys keep us updated about your college admissions process. <laughs> um, We've got some okay. lofty goals. Lofty goals. <laughs> you won't just. No, I, I think actually had me take a look at the application and say yes or no to any questions like I would, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. Every board member had to do that <laughs> exercise, and you know, we're talking about your your leadership skills and the things you've done that would make you a good proponent for this position. I, I thought it was excellent. Yeah, so, yeah, it's really good. Thank you. All right, uh, we're going to move into our time schedule appointments, starting with uh, the opening enrollment from Rath. Exactly the same as So uh, once a year, we take a deeper dive into our enrollment, and we usually do it um, around this time for a couple of reasons. Um, so our enrollment is directly tied to our education fund. So there's a period of time in the state of Vermont, the 10th to the 30th day of school, we refer to it as the ADM period, when um, we submit data to the state about our enrollment during that period, and the state uses that in their complicated formula to allocate resources to us. Um, so enrollment is always something that we're really acutely aware of, and um, I've been really appreciative to work with Jim, and like we've kind of fine-tuned some systems so that we're sharing data as quickly as we can, and that he's able to use that in his projections. Um, so, and, and the other thing to remember about the ADM period is that what I'm gonna show you today is an enrollment of students who are enrolled in our schools. Our ADM also includes pre-K students who are enrolled in private pre -Ks. So there is a little bit of difference there. Um, and, and so, this is sort of a, a slight underestimate of, of what our actual enrollment would be for ADM. Um, so to cut to the chase, um, our district enrollment is stable at 1,001 students. Um, this is exactly the same number that we had in September of last year. Um, but there were some big changes at some schools, which I'll go into. Um, so overall, our enrollment is stable, um, but there has been quite a bit of change in some of the schools. Um, so this table is in your board book, but I um, just wanted to kind of walk through it as well. Um, as you can see, the biggest change occurred at Barnard Academy where um, as of right now, there are 57 students. Um, last year in September, there were 71 students. Um, so that ends up being a reduction of 20% for the school and 14 students um, who, who are not enrolled there any longer. And going school by school, you'll see that um, Killington and Reading had um, 
Reading had a larger percentage change, but you know, pretty modest changes in terms of the actual number of students compared to last year. Prosper Valley had a pretty large increase. Um, and this was due to a larger um, fifth grade class that came up and a relatively small seventh grade class that got picked up. Um, Woodstock Elementary also had um, an increase, um, but I believe this is due in large part to adding another pre-K classroom um, to Woodstock Elementary. So those pre-K classrooms are included in that enrollment as well. Um, middle school, high school, a decrease of 13 students um, compared to last year um, for a decrease of 2.9%. So when we're looking at um, our actual funding, um, Jim has taught me it's important to break out you know, what the tuition funding source is. Um, and so the operating school district, those are the students that actually count towards our ADM and go into the, the, the complicated formulas. Um, so Jim has worked to kind of take this number and estimate how many um, students we would have through that funding mechanism. So that number decreased um, some this, this year compared to last year, so we were down 1.3% there. Um, what was really encouraging was that um, our students who were coming from other districts increased um, by 13, or 13 students, 14%. Um, and so this was driven largely by um, enrollment from Weathersfield. Um, so Weathersfield enrollment increased by nine students which is an increase of 47%, so that's a really big increase. Um, and just sort of anecdotally hearing from Raina and Jim, um, a lot of that was uh, students who were interested in potentially being part of the new build and who wanted to come here. And there was also a lot of work done to try to secure transportation for those students as well. Um, so I know Raina is working a lot on that. Um, In terms of town by town, I um, wanted to just share sort of how it breaks down from um, towns where they had the biggest change compared to last year um, and in terms of adding students and then towns where, where there was an I think you had a 7% increase, which is really good because it's our smallest school. So I would think for sure they would try to kill them. Is this um, technically by town or by school? By town. So, so this is town. residents. So even if they choose a different school. Correct. This is just absolute um, you know, number of students in pre-K through 12 um, who are residents of any one of the towns um, within, within our supervisory unit. Um, so it's you know, it's it, it's just sort of interesting to see wh where there has been growth in the last year, um, and, and where those numbers are are going down a little bit. Um, the other another piece that I, I wanted to highlight th this is focusing just on on Woodstock Elementary. Woodstock Elementary is now pulling um, students from a number of different towns. Um, across I mean, both within our district and, and outside of our district. Um, the students outside the district are attending their um, pre-K programs, um, so there's, so they're coming for a couple of different reasons. But um, in the past, the board has, has asked this question around, you know, what is the town enrollment at Woodstock Elementary look like? And and right now, you know, there are 12 students from Reading who are attending Woodstock Elementary and 10 students from Barnard. Um, so there's 22 students at Woodstock Elementary who, um, for one reason or another, have, have elected to go there instead of their 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 home sending schools. And this includes pre-K or it doesn't? It does include pre-K, yes. Um, another question which has come up in the past has been how many students are leaving our district. Um, compared to the same period last year, um, so this year we had 40 students unenrolled from our schools. Um, in the same period last year, we had 21 students. Um, so, so a pretty big increase there. Um, what the largest increase occurred in students who were transferring to other public schools in Vermont. Last year, um, we only had one student leave to go to another public school in Vermont. This year, um, we had 12 in the same period. Um, and this is showing this kind of interesting shift 
around COVID where um, during the pandemic, we really saw very few students who were transferring to other public schools in Vermont. Um, and um, we saw a lot of students who were, who were moving to another state or another country. Um, prior to the pandemic, it was the other way around. Most of our transfers occurred to other, other schools in the state of Vermont. So it's kind of moving back to a little bit like it was before, before the pandemic. And the last piece is just like um, a comparison of our September student enrollment over time. Um, you'll see that we had we were stable um, for the last two years, um, and that our, our enrollment district wide um, is comparable to where we were in 2017. And, and when did the pre K start? Good question. It's been phased in over multiple years, um, and the program has expanded. Off the top of my head, I don't. I think our first program was in 2017, but that was it was not district wide at that point. I don't remember which year it became district wide. Anna, do you have a question? Yeah, I'm not sure that this is the appropriate time for it, but I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar. Um, I'm aware of um, some folks that have been attending Reading um, from Weathersfield. They plan on just attending for pre-K uh, until they have space to go with their local towns. Uh, but it'd be a really good recruitment opportunity to reach out to those folks and see, um, you know, if there's a way I've been trying to convince them, but if there's, you know, things that they're looking or unaware of our district that would sell them on staying within our district as opposed to um, heading back to their Weathersfield schools. Well, they wouldn't have a choice because they what you they can't tuition. They'd be paying out of pocket, right? Right. And we do not allow for currently place students. So because Weathersfield offers an elementary school, um, they have to return to that elementary school. But once, and I think it only goes to eighth grade, Weathersfield. Weathersfield goes to eighth grade. Okay. So then for high school, they could choose Postdoc Union High School. Thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, you know, Barnard uh, population at the school went down 14 uh, but the town itself only lost seven kids. Um, and then you show the number of how many kids from Barnard are attending West. So, you know, clearly some parents have decided to send their kids to West, even though they live in Barnard. And I think that's perfectly fine. I love the fact that we do our elementary school choice. Um, sometimes families want to buy a new home in a different town and keep their kids in the same school. So I think it's a great program. But are there are there sort of like guardrails on or limits mm -hmm. on it so you don't mm -hmm. end up with like a, a really high uh, student to teacher ratio? So annually, so there's a policy for that interdistrict choice. Um, parents apply, they give a first and second choice. Um, the first determinant is what is the class size currently in that grade in that building. And so I always look to the principals first. Do you have capacity in your rooms based on the number size? And if they don't, then I will decline that request. Um, once a parent chooses to shift schools, then you have to continue to stay in that. You can't keep switching back and forth. So there's some very, and it's on a website, so interdistrict choice, and parents have to make some decisions at the beginning. And Raina, oh, oh great one, monitors all that. And so twice a year, I, I review that and make a determination whether we have capacity for students to move. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I think it's noteworthy that we're not declining. I think there are only six districts in the state of Vermont out of 55 that are maintaining or increasing in student enrollment. Most are having significant declines in enrollment. So the, I would love to see an uphill pitch, and I never... I, I wait till today and I don't harass RAP anymore about enrollment because it makes me crazy too. But I think it's really important to note that all other districts, majority in the state of Vermont, are seriously losing students. We are not. We are maintaining them. Yeah, I would I would hope that we could minimally maintain while we kind of feel the uncertainty about what a new bill will look like. Um because it's certainly talk around the state for many families of like, is this, is this worth, did we choose the right place? Um, you know, hospitals, 
the whole state, it's not just educational, so the whole state's struggling. Mm -hmm. And it's it goes back to this common theme of a declining state population mm -hmm. um, and an economy based in tourism. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you very much, Rob. Thanks. Um, second, we have um, Patty Kelly is going to present about math in Mountain View School District. Hey everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me and letting me take a few minutes here to tell everybody about what's going on. Um, can I just make sure everybody can hear me okay? We're yep. yeah, okay, great. Um, so I wanted to take a few minutes tonight to just walk through some of the main pieces of math work that's happening across the district, let you know sort of what's happened the last few years, what we're moving towards, and um answer any questions you might have. So we can go ahead to the first slide. So I wanted to tell you all about um, some of the professional development that's happening across the district in math. There's a lot going on. Um, so Math Pact is about um, professional development days that we're offering teachers that um, are focused on this book called the Math Pact, but the intention with the book is around building our whole district math agreements. So having collaborative conversations to co-create our agreements across the district, pre-K-12, around our language, our routines, our representations, our instructional practices um, within our classrooms and having opportunities to talk about those and engage in those and read research about all of those areas um, and really solidify that coherence across grade levels. So um, several years ago, we started with our five through 12 grade teachers that came together. We had 14 of them um, that worked together for eight days um, on building those initial sets of agreements. The following year, so last year, um, I worked with 29 teachers across the district where um, we were working with pre-K through fourth grade teachers uh, with similar components in terms of looking at these um, instructional aspects within their grade levels and across grade bands so that teachers could see how that progression of learning happened across the grade levels. The book that we're reading, thankfully, it has three different versions of the book. So it um, was the same core, it's the same core text, but we're able to provide those targeted examples for the grade levels that people are working in. Um, and then this year, now we're at the stage where we've worked with um, that middle school, high school band, we've worked with the core of our elementary grade levels, but now we're bringing in, um, we have 17 people this year who are fairly new to the district. So the the pattern has been the, the people who are new to the district, elementary grade levels, they'll work, they'll do the literacy professional development the first year, and then they'll come and do the math work the second year. So a number of them are people fairly new to the district. And then we also have a group of special educators that are joining us this year. And we're going to work with them for four days. Um, I'm able to compact it a little bit now that we have that core, some core documents and pieces refined. Um, but it's been an incredible opportunity to build the collaboration across the district and really bring that like common language, common approaches to teaching and learning mathematics across the district. Um, so that's been huge to be able to build that into the system that we make sure that our new educators have those resources, have that perspective of how we approach and teaching our and approach teaching and learning for math in our district. And then that consistency for students across grade levels is already showing itself as we're going through classrooms and the accuracy and the math vocabulary that students are using is pretty exceptional. I've been seeing it um, over and over again as I'm going into classrooms. And so another piece of professional development that we're offering this year is um, I have uh, we have 14 people, DeVo Sleeper, Jen Mayo, and myself are facilitating um, a book group. There are two different versions of the same series. One of them is a focus on addition and subtraction. Another one is a focus on multiplication and division. 
these books are uh, uh, written by Vermont, very well-known Vermont math educators. And um, they're based on this uh, progression of learning from um, an ongoing assessment project. It's a, again, very well-known in Vermont set of trainings around um, that progression of how students learn addition and subtraction and then how they learn multiplication and division. So that book group is coming together and we've already had one meeting that was an amazing discussion. With that, we also had four teachers, including myself, who had an opportunity to join another neighboring district over the summer and do a really in-depth training for the addition and subtraction strand. And so we're building that capacity in the district, having that depth of knowledge. It's um, This is a really good opportunity to increase everyone's capacity in that way. So in addition to that, we um, also had conversations last year with really wanting to make sure that paraprofessionals across the district were supported with their math and literacy toolboxes, as well as their social emotional learning um, resources so that they could support their students. So I'm also partnering with Lori Phelan, Shana, and Julie Brown and myself, and we're doing a series for para, the paraprofessionals across the district to support them. So I'll be running two sessions of our Late Start Wednesdays, um, focusing on the math progressions and math tools that paraprofessionals can use for working with students across the district. Um, it really is providing, again, another opportunity for that common language, that collaborative approach, so that we're all understanding and supporting teachers, or supporting students in similar ways. Um, we still have our math equity worker that has been working for a number of years now that was in um that was a group that was formed before i came here so and i'm this is my fourth year now and so that work group is uh pre-k through 12th grade teachers we have 14 of us on the committee we have meetings about once a month and we tend to meet for two days during the summer as well that is more of a broader um, view of our mission, vision, vision, and goals for the district. And so we are mapping out our um, action steps, our specific goals and action steps related to assessment and reporting, uh, student engagement, our instructional practices, and our systems, and our collective efficacy. So that work is ongoing. And again, another opportunity for us to make those connections across the district and make sure that students are having similar experiences across schools, having access to the same types of supports and resources, and that we're being really efficient and thoughtful about how we're, we're working across the district. Um, another piece that I have put together, I started this last year, but I send out a monthly newsletter to staff so that um, I can provide updates. I tend to link new research articles or something that's in sort of the math world that might be interesting to our, I, I do just send it out to the elementary group right now um, that might be some new learning for them or something that's related to work that we're working on. Um, I'll also put in professional development opportunities that are being offered regionally. So outside of our district, the Agency of Education is offering a number of math-related professional development opportunities that are so short sessions after school. And so I make sure that educators know about those and have access to them if they're of interest. So we can go to the next slide. Um, another piece of our math that is happening across the district right now. Um, our K through fourth grade teachers are, um, a number of them are piloting two different math programs. So the math programs, it's a little bit confusing, but essentially um, the program itself is uh, illustrative mathematics. So the two publishers that we're pi piloting two different publishers versions of the same program. 
which is a little odd. It's not something that we've seen before in, in the publishing math program world, but um, it's working out really well because we're able to see that um, the program itself, the illustrative mathematics is a really high quality program. Um, and we're seeing that the publishers have both added in different types of supplemental material. So different supports, how the online systems work. And so our teachers are um, testing those out. And so we have teachers that are testing each of those two publishers versions of the programs. And we're going to come together in November to determine, uh, we have a survey ready for teachers to get feedback and determine which one really meets our needs better. Um, but already it's really, um, been an opportunity for us to see how it can support having a really solid scope and sequence, prioritizing, prioritizing our instruction on focus areas and standards that we want to make sure students are having a lot of experience with. And again, it's those common routines, those common practices that um, we want to make sure students are able to bring from one year to the next. So one of the things about this program that's really been beneficial, and I've already had a lot of conversations with teachers about it, is one component is um, these centers. So essentially, there's some, some math-related games. But what's neat about this program is it has multiple stages of the same game. So let's say a student might learn a game in kindergarten, and they'll use it in context with kindergarten standards, but then they'll play that same game in first grade, but maybe now they're adding and subtracting. And then in third grade, they might play the same game and they're doing it with multiplication and division. And so the benefits of those from a teacher perspective and from a student perspective is that we're not teaching the routines in the same way. We're not spending the instructional time on how to play the game. We're spending the instructional time on the math of the game and really focusing on supporting building that content and that depth of knowledge within the content. Um, and so we're already seeing um, as I'm, I'm talking to teachers and getting feedback about that, that that's been really helpful. Um, so we, I have put together a lot of resources to try to support teachers and families with the information about these programs. So there's a Padlet that I um, have linked in the slideshow as well. That's for teachers to have some additional resources. So um, there's, for example, there's an article in there specifically about using this program with multi-age, um, multi-grade level classrooms. So we have a number of those classes in our district. And so it gives some tips for teachers around that. And so that's available for teachers to get some additional information. And then I also have put together the family information document to let families know a little bit more about these programs. Um, I will say that once we do select one of these two programs, both of them have really fantastic um, family resource hubs is what they're calling them, but um, they're really wonderful series of videos for each unit for that the students are going to be going through and um, sort of overview videos and resources and things like that. So um, I think in that way, this program will really support our families knowing exactly what it is our students are learning in the classroom and the types of ways that they can support them at home. So next one. Uh, just a few extra things that are going on the way I, you know, things that I'm doing to spend my days. I've been very, very busy this year, but some of the extra pieces are that um, I am booked in to all the all of the schools for at least one day a month where I'm in the buildings and I'm there to support teachers and help out um, in whatever way they need. I can consult with them. I can attend meetings. I can help um you know connect people it's been I've already done one round in all of the schools and it's been pretty amazing to be in the cl classrooms and um 
have, I mean, they just have been so welcoming. The schools have been incredible, but it's also been a really great opportunity for me to, in more of a, in, in their environment, in the, in the teacher's classrooms, I'm able to see things that when they're asking me for support about things, when I can go through and watch the classrooms in the other buildings, I can find people and help connect them to um, things that they're doing, things that are happening across the district in ways that they can support each other too. So that's been a really um, great opportunity for me to connect with everyone. I've also been able to attend, facilitate some faculty meetings, all um, helping to support the in-service days, of course, and data meetings in the schools. Um, so that's really building. There's been a huge increase, in my opinion, the last few years, working with teachers around their data literacy and their assessment literacy, their ability to look at data and talk about the data and in conjunction with building the common vocabulary, the common resources, we're able to look at math work and understand the progression of learning, understanding how to build supports for students in the classrooms and use data to inform our instruction. Um, that's just, I, I feel like all of these pieces that we've been putting in place have really are starting to show how much of a difference it can make in us having very deep conversations about what our students need and how to move forward. So as I'm doing all of these pieces, um, I'm trying as much as possible to make myself available for teachers as they need it. If they wanna just sit down and look at a piece of student work and have some feedback about what I'm seeing um, for a student and what supports might be helpful to them or if they want to co-teach a lesson or help develop an instructional plan. Um, I'll go in sometimes and do some more diagnostic math testing with students so that I can help them develop a plan to support them. Um, whatever it is they might need in that way, I'm trying to make myself available for that as well. Um, and then with the new report card for the elementary schools, uh, Julie Brown and I have both been developing report card supports for families. So I have a series of um, slide decks that will be available per grade level aligned with the report card so that we have linked resources for families so that they can um, access games, information, um, resources to help their children from home. Um, I did want to also mention on the high school side, I've been working with the math department as well. We've been really looking at our math pathways for students to make sure that we have a really broad selection for students in terms of continuing their math education beyond the required credits and that they have access to um, really strong math programming and options of pathways throughout the high school program. So that was a, a lot going on, but um, thank you so much for your time. And if there's any any questions at all, please go ahead. <laughs> questions from board members? I'll just share. So I did the first math pack grade five through 12. And previously math teacher, and it was just so exciting hearing a fifth grade teacher talk to an AP Calc teacher about how you teach ratios. And, and, and that may not sound exciting to you, but when you're a student and every time you have a different math teacher, they teach the same concept a little differently or use different language, we as the educators get in the way of students progressing. And so the more we can think about how we teach these core concepts over time, that's consistent, we don't get in the way of students learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really important as someone who can, you know, some students start, you know, everyone loves math, Patty, and we can all do math, but there are some students, just the change of a word using a different language or con presenting a concept a little differently can really interrupt a student's learning of a concept. So I just, I really had a lot of fun and Patty did an amazing job. And I know all the teachers who came to those Trainings really appreciate that opportunity to talk about really important work that we want to do better. I'll just make a comment. Yes. Patty, I heard from DeVoe Sleeper that she's really impressed with the results of the program she's piloting at, at West, that it's like it's really working. 
So I thought that was encouraging. That's great to hear. I, um, I've, I've done a lot of work in the zone of, of curriculum and, and reviewing curriculum materials. And I've always really, really liked this program. Um, I think the thing that makes me really excited, what I was hopeful for was that teachers would feel that it was really usable, that they could access and find the materials that they needed really easily. And that seems to be the case, which to me, you know, you can have a program that has all the bells and whistles, but if a teacher can't find it when they need it, you know, it becomes overwhelming and not usable. They can't then transfer those resources for their students. But I'm finding that these this program is very easy to find what they need. And um, I just make, I think it makes their work efficient and they can really focus on students and what the students need to move forward. Anybody else? Well, thank you, Patty. That was very helpful um, to hear all the different things that are going on and to understand better what uh, the professional development side of things uh, looks like. And it's great to hear that there's positive results being um, felt by the staff themselves. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Okay. Uh, we're now going to move to the committee reports. The finance committee, I, I know Ben is not here to speak to it, but um, does anyone from finance have a report beyond what uh, Jim has also reported? All right, well then we'll move. Yeah, I was, uh, so yeah, I was I there. I, what Jim is saying is part of the focus of the group right now is looking at what the budget needs are, how are we going to achieve those cuts? How, what are the different opportunities? So it's, there've been some long meetings and I think what Ben wanted to share, others are invited to come to those meetings if your committee is a meeting during that time. So if you're interested in learning what the finance group is looking at. We, we also Thanks, spent a little Gary, bit of time I looking- un Unmute in time. <laughs> That's all I was going to say. Thank you. We we also spent a little time looking at some long term uh, stability measures such as a fund balance policy and other things. Um, we will we'll spend some more time on those as we go forward. Then we'll move to the policy. Good evening, everyone. Um, so in keeping with tonight's theme on uh, advancement of curriculum, and uh, we are we have three policies that uh, go along uh, with that with that idea. So the first, and I'd like to uh, three policies that we uh, are for uh, first read, and then we have one uh, quick one that for adoption. So the three policies. The first one is D twenty, which is really curriculum development and coordination, really just sort of codifying that it's the responsibility of the board um, to collaborate with the districts to, uh, to oversee um, the curriculum development. And uh, part of that uh, you know, has to do with that. You basically need to follow the state board's guidance, et cetera. Um, we also added on this basically what the definition of a curriculum uh, is. So um, this is something, you know, we wanted to have all three of these policies in, 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 uh, on board just to, um, just again, to codify the board's involvement. So I'm gonna take them separately in terms of voting. So we're looking for a motion for the board to accept this uh, policy D20 for the first reading. Is there a motion to accept the first reading? So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor of uh, accepting this first reading, we said aye. aye. Great, thank you. So the D22 is selection of library materials. Again, sort of similar in spirit to this. And this has to do with uh, basically uh, making sure that uh, the, the uh, library has a process for selecting and reconsidering um, library materials. Um, just for your information, this is coincident with uh, a Act 150, which is passed this, uh, this spring with 
uh, by the legislature, which basically says you need to have a policy uh, on board to be able to um, uh, especially to evaluate if, uh, if there's a challenge to um, the material and also to um, basically make sure that your material is consistent with the values of, of this of the district of the school. So we are a public library, so we um, we are with this policy we would be uh, uh, in compliance with that. So um, uh, there, and there is you know a process. Part of this is is the procedure, which is if there is a challenge to any of the material, there's there's a, a formal process to uh, to evaluate that. So uh, again, this one I would like a motion for the board to accept this as uh, as a first reading. Motion. Thank you, Adam. Second. Second. Okay, Heather, did you want to? No, uh, just discuss. Second. Any... Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, all in favor, please say aye or raise your hand on screen. Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, and then uh, the third one is D23, which is uh, similar to the library one, but it's basically talking about the curriculum, actual material. Um, and it, it, um, it delineates that um, the development of the curriculum and challenges for reconsideration would have to go through a process. And I put that process, we don't normally vote on procedures, but the procedure is actually there for your information. It's in a draft form. But if there were, if there were uh, a challenge or a reconsideration of any material for the curriculum, there is actually, then there would be a process for how that would, um, how would that would take place. So, um, uh, and again, when you're voting for this, you're voting for the policy, not for the procedure. The procedures uh, are developed by the administration. So I guess I'm asking for first uh, um, to accept this as a first reading. Motion to accept as a first reading. I am on fire. That's what we need to hear. That's why I put on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Yay, and there's Sam. All right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Hi. Okay. I just have one more, which is really quickie. It's basically that um, we passed a policy, I think this past uh, fall, uh, last fall rather, a year ago, that uh, basically was F3 and it was entitled just, um, uh, you know, fire drills. And um, I think Sherry told me at the time there was something new coming. And now that is Really, it's the same policy, and same text, but it's called option-based response. So it so it incorporates different uh, different actions that students can take. So it's not um, and and faculty can take. So it's basically the same thing. I'm just asking to retitle the same policy, if, and I wanted that. Uh, I was asking for that as an adoption, not to put it through all the steps of uh, first and second reads. I just wanted it you know, to change the title to update it, be consistent with the SBA. Move to adopt title change for F3. Go ahead and second. Okay, Corinne and then Anna, thank you. All in favor of uh, the name change? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Abstain. Okay. Um, all right, building and grounds. Um, I'll just give a quick update. We did meet on September 16th. Um, we have received a budget proposal from the engineer uh, that had assessed the, the status of the roof and the beams that support it in the high school gymnasium. Uh, this particular proposal is to put together construction drawings um, that would allow the district to issue an RFP for a construction company to come in um, and make proposals to reinforce the beams and, and bring the, the roof back up to modern code for, for loading events, snow loading. And the committee was in favor of, of engaging the engineer to conduct that work. So this is kind of like step one, get the engineering drawings that we need for construction and then go out and ask um, contractors to bid. Um, it was a pretty small uh, 
budgetary proposal, I think it was like 18,000 and it, you know, fits within the current budget this year. So we, we proved that. Um, we talked about projects that are remaining that need to be completed in the, uh, this fiscal year. So before June 30th, and there are still a, it's a short list, but there are some that, um, that buildings and grounds intends to finish this, this season. Um, and then we kind of set the stage for our next meeting in terms of uh, being prepared for that meeting to, to rank um, all the projects that would go in the next fiscal year budget so that we, you know, select and, and do the ones that are most urgent because we know we'll have a reduced budget going into next season. Um, and then I'll just like anecdotally, you know, we learned about a classroom in the high school where uh, they decided for good reason to remove some some sinks that were used for for photography and um, that process of like removing um, plumbing, you know, exposed some very, very old pipes that sort of just fell apart in front of their eyes. And so now the request has been to add new sinks back to the ones that were removed and you can't because there's there's nothing to hook up to the pipes sort of disintegrated and um, I think it's emblematic of sort of what we're facing with the high school and you know in order to try to put a sink back in place you have to start cutting through the cinder blocks and chasing these pipes until you found uh, you know potentially like solid pipe that you could work with or you'd have to replace it all and that's really, really expensive, really disruptive, um, you know, all, all to have a, a sink back in the room. So we, you know, I don't think buildings and grounds is going to support that. We did not support the effort to try to replace that sink. And, and so maybe the lesson learned is don't touch things that are working. Like maybe we shouldn't have, maybe we shouldn't have removed those old sinks because once you touch the old stuff, it's really hard to put in new stuff in the building. Uh, that's the that's the report from okay. EMG. Unless uh, Joe, uh, I think Joel's on. Yeah. Well, okay. Joe, do you have anything to add to that? Not much, really. Uh, he hit the nail on the head here. What we discussed, um, just buildings and grounds right now is in the middle of uh, the seasonal transition. We're firing up all the heating systems, so uh, next next few weeks are going to be a uh, telltale. Hopefully things uh, will run smoothly, fingers crossed. Um, it's budget season. And as Matt indicated, um, we're going to be prioritizing projects here because I know uh, there's going to be some tough choices here coming down the line. Thank you, buildings and grounds. Negotiations, um, the report I can give is that uh, we received today the letter uh, from the support staff personnel that they would like to engage in um, negotiating their new contract. So um, that's John Williams, Ryan Townsend, and myself who are on that working group, or I don't know if it's truly a committee. I think it's- No, it's a committee. Okay, well, I think it was gonna be a working group, but it doesn't really matter to me. Um, and uh, so we'll be starting that process soon. Any other working groups? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, solely in an effort to save the uh, policy committee some time, I just want to mention that the motion of accepting your first reading does not denote future action. So whether you'd like to bring it back for a second reading at your next meeting or adopt it at your next meeting, that will also take a motion. Okay. And can we do them as a group of three? At your next meeting? No, no. I mean, if oh, we... Oh, no. Yeah. I don't see that. All right. Motion to move all three uh, towards second reading. I'll second it. What she said. Okay. <laughs> um, all in favor of the second reading. Aye. 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 Thank you, Raina. <laughs> Point of order. There should be um, acceptance and then um, uh, Non acceptance and then abstention for every movement. It shouldn't be everyone who accepts and then no one else gets to speak. Just point of order. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone want to speak at this time? 
Okay. All right. Um, any other working groups have an update? No. All right. Then we have a, a set of minutes to approve that are in the board, the board book. So does anybody have a correction or a change that needs to be made to the minutes from September 9th? All right, can we make a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Oh, yeah. Oh, Second. Um, are all in favor of approving the minutes? I have. Do we, do we want to ask I, for any? Uh, any I, abstentions or nays? Abstentions. Okay. Um, now we have time again for public comment. So if there's anybody who would like to speak, please let us know. Uh, seeing no public comment, um, we do need to have um, probably three, well, three, but probably brief um, updates around labor. The first one being motion to enter executive session regarding a labor relations agreement under 1 VSA 313A1B. Is there a motion for that? I'll public? make the motion to enter executive session. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Matt. All in favor? Aye. All right, thank you to everyone who's attended thus far. Um, we probably will have at least one decision coming out of these three executive sessions. Is there a motion coming out of the executive session? Yeah, a uh, motion to approve uh, a proposal of by of the CBA members and proposed benefits change. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Okay. Um, I'm going to, we're going to need to, if we have any, uh, nothing, Anything besides an A, um, we have to do a roll call. So um, uh, all those in favor of the uh, proposal, please say aye. Aye. Uh, uh, those opposed? Any abstentions? I'll abstain. That's Josh. No. Okay, the uh, motion passes. I think for an abstention, I don't have to do a roll call. I think it's only for a no vote, but Heather may know better than me on that one. <laughs> no, you, uh, it's perfect. Okay. All in favor, All right. abstain, abstention, perfect. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to enter executive session regarding an employee matter under 1 VSA 313A3? So moved. Carrie, do you need me for the other two um, no, no, I sessions? Don't. Enjoy, All right. Enjoy the rest of your vacation. All right. I'll see you later. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. So, Katie, motion second was Anna will who second. Was Anna. Okay. Okay. On, uh, sorry. So, um, Sherry is going to just give us a very brief update don't on. Don't forget to turn oh. off the recording. I don't know what I'm going to say. There was no action taken in the second executive session, and um, we have one more executive session to enter regarding an employee matter under one BSA three thirteen A three. I'll make a motion? a motion that we go into executive session. Okay, and is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Josh. Uh, we have exited the executive session with no action taken. Is uh, We should be processing what we did well, what we can do better. Anybody have a comment? I felt really good about my ability to put some stuff forward <laughs> in the motion department. And it's worth something. I just want some appreciation. Sam, if you're here and participating, maybe you could validate me. Adam, I'm always, I'm literally just here to validate you. Like, that's my whole purpose on this board. So, Adam, great I job. Couldn't, 
I couldn't yeah. have seconded on all those motions without you initiating them. I do want to have a call out for Heather Lawler for, for bringing up the abstention option. Thank you, Heather. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. And thank you for all the thoughts you shared, Heather. Appreciate it. Um, I, I have one thought, and maybe we can just consider it. The, each of the directors presents at every board meeting. And I think that's a lot for them to come to these meetings once a month. Um, kind of adds to their job, right? And, you know, if you're, maybe if, if they came, uh, maybe just two directors each month, we rotated, I, I, it would, maybe we get more value out of what they want to share at that meeting. Um, just a thought. I mean, I, I'm not saying we couldn't do this without Jim Ben. I think he's sort of very different. But uh, me, can I skip? Yeah, you can do it next month you get off. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm talking about the directors that report to you. <laughs> yeah, just, we, can, we can alternate. That. <clears throat> but, yeah. It's just something to think about. Could we alternate? Well, I think when, this, when the report speaks for itself, yeah. They don't need to say it again, assuming that it's we still provide it. But if there's something yeah. particular that they would like to highlight, yeah. um, I don't have a problem with them coming remotely either. I mean, uh, yeah, I would almost encourage, like, especially the ones that live they, far away. They really want to be here in person, let them go home mm -hmm. and do it from the comfort of their house. Like, yeah. yeah. How do you feel about principals? Do you want principals here? I think principals could be remote unless you have like some. Some understanding it's it's important, like it's something pretty pressing, okay. right? But I, I I personally think that's a very you know tell uh, virtual communication is pretty effective. Is it required that principals? I said required. Oh, interesting. I just thought they were. You just go get. It. I did. I yeah. thought that. But well, I mean, <laughs> it's not like I twist their arms, but yeah. in terms of representation questions, but with Zoom, it does make it really different. I know that would be really kind, and they would appreciate it. Um, but I felt that. Board wanted them there, so I've been tough loving them. So that's well, it's good information. Right. Um, what they what they offer us on the report is very good information with lots of links. Mm -hmm. And um, but I think if if um, they have something particular they want to call out, that's what they should do. But they don't have to recap the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, assuming we're all literate here, <laughs> so you speak about literacy. Um, and, you know, honestly, probably some people don't look at the board book till afterwards and because they do say something about the report mm -hmm. and they want to follow up with that. But I think we should be humane about some of them drive long distance. Sure. I know that. Yeah. Thank you. Good feedback. All right. Anything we can do better? Well, and Matt gave us a proposal on that, that we could do our meetings better with, you know, not having so much of that. Maybe less heat. Yes, <laughs> don't even get for yeah. Let's not talk about the system. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, Adam has uh, moved it. I'll <laughs> second. I'm seconding it. Thank Good you, night, everybody. Thank Good you night, all. Mm -hmm.